Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Elitist Geek on... Game and Friday, yes! <laughs> Game and Friday, indeed. Don't you love how these Fridays roll around when you need them? We need them, bro. We need them huge. It has been uh, crazy at work and just crazy in general, so really good to get uh, back to a Friday where you just don't have to worry about stuff. And you can relax. That's the point of why we do these and um, kind of the point... Get my on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And that... And the point of why I do the news bit, right? It's enjoyable and it's something we all enjoy that is only going to get cooler by the month and by the year. And we're getting into an exciting time frame, 2017, with a lot of those changes, things we've been waiting for getting announced, and stuff that's just being released, really starting to get support behind it. All right. Next up, we have a device called Bridge from a, a company called Occipital. And what it's allowing, you know, rather than modding existing headsets with extra cameras, they've announced their device called the Bridge. It's a mobile headset designed for use with Apple's iPhones and not just the current iPhone 7s. Also works with 6 and 6S. I still have my 6 Plus around. Uh, features its own structure sensor mounted on top of a fairly traditional looking phone based headset rather than an open slot and basically what it does is it has an adjustable lens that augments the existing camera in your iPhone to provide and this is pretty amazing 120 degree field of view which should look amazing and allow for some really good head positional tracking visuals now on the vr front and speaking about tracking specifically they've got uh dev kits dubbed explorer editions that are going to allow content creators to implement positional tracking either into new apps or existing experiences that may have previously been available on ios for like google cardboard also offering its own bridge engine, which plays a bigger part in VR. So they're going to provide the tools to be able to create VR applications, games, experiences. Now, according to them, the system works with existing iOS VR apps and videos. Now, developers can use a Unity plugin and the existing bridge engine SDK to create completely brand new experiences. How much traction is this technology going to get? Uh, how effective will it be? Let's just say at this point, I'm not willing to buy a bridge for my old iPhone 6 Plus that I mentioned I have laying around. But if it does pick up a little bit, yeah, I may, if it's not too expensive, see what it's all about. Next up, Tim Sweeney, Epic Games co-founder, says VR is going to make companies more powerful than any government. Now, if this sounds a little bit like a uh, conspiracy theory gone wild, it kind of reads like it, but uh, I'll get into this anyways. Uh, he talks about his usual kind of open disdain for non-open platforms. And I share a lot of that. You guys, a lot of you share a lot of that. Um, he believes that any company that has closed systems and encompass the internet under that platform have the potential to be powerful, more powerful than any existing government. And these are his own words that I'll read. He says, there's an ethic that needs to develop in the VR industry. IBM's PC was built with open components and open designs that anyone could purchase and access. All of that early platform stuff was built by outside people because it was so open. But in VR, money-grubbing VCs have caused a trend towards closed systems, and that is a problem. He talks about Oculus Home, says, uh, Oculus Home is okay to me. I don't have a problem with exclusive content. I only have a problem when companies start blocking any outside programs from running on their hardware. And he goes on to explain, exclusives mean that Oculus is funding third-party projects, and that's a perfectly valid way to jumpstart an industry. That's what we talked about the other day. He ends with, the idea is you should be able to buy any device and run any program that a developer wants on it. There shouldn't be any platform at the center deciding what games 
people can or cannot make. There can be app stores, but companies shouldn't force consumers to only be able to access content through that app store. And the part of this story, you know, that really kind of resonates with me is his vision of what a future VR world is going to look like. And it's all that untapped potential that we talked about in the first two news stories. He sees that all there available and one company potentially harnessing the majority of it. And I think that's where he's coming from. But really, does there need to be that kind of a fear at this point? You know, is the growth going to be organic and slow enough? We're going to see it unfold. Is it going to be able to fool a big chunk of people to, you know, blindly have them channeled into one direction? I'd like to think no, but, you know, maybe there is some validity to what he says. My thinking, I wouldn't be that concerned at this point. Like I said, watch it unfold. It's probably going to be slow and gradual enough to, you know, be digested in chunks. And I'm sure most of us, uh, yeah, won't blindly be led into dark paths like that. I could be wrong. I'd like to think I'm not. And uh, if we start going down that path, please pipe up in the comments, guys. Next up, Facebook's prototype touch controllers that let you feel the heat of fire or the chill of ice. Now, these things were actually pretty cool. And, uh, you know, aside from a little bit of a cheesy video with Mark Zuckerberg and uh, some of his big wigs around him there, they had a team that presented two touch controllers. And how this technology works is, let's see if I can explain this correctly, it's Pelchier coolers, which take advantage of the thermoelectric effect which turns a voltage difference into a temperature difference. The prototype wasn't perfect, and it was noted that after continued use, the controller couldn't get as hot or as cold as it could at the start of a play session. So what they showed was an example with this cooling system where literally the person via the touch controller would grab something and have the cold sensation of ice or a heat sensation that effect you know got weaker throughout the experience it's also a massive energy drain right now so i think they said with your typical uh, android or ios phone style battery you could drain that with continued use of that effect within about 18 minutes which is hugely fast so what they're going to rely on is illusions to maintain that feeling so that initial one, and then probably just moments where it's kind of brought up again in you know a slightly different version of that effect, just to maintain the illusion. And then it probably gets implemented fully on whatever set intervals of X number of seconds. I don't know. But very cool just the fact that they can start mimicking stuff like that because we've seen all kinds of other haptic feedback. Most of that has to do with the body suits, the sensation of touch, of grabbing, but not really thermal, right? Heat, cold. So very cool. Let's see if that actually develops into something. Now, this last story I thought was kind of neat. Uh, it comes from CBC, which is kind of our version, Canada's version of the BBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And they talked about a study. They never said who did the study or who conducted it. At least I didn't see when I was researching it. But it's a study involving 18 men, 18 women, and they were basically made to try two different types of motion games using VR HMDs. They also didn't specify which HMDs were used in the experiments. More than half, so if there was 36 in total, more than half, I would assume that's 20 to 24 experienced some form of motion sickness uh, in that group. Now, or sorry, of that group, those who felt nausea, 78% were women. And 22% only 
The remainder were men. So basically five of the 18 men reported motion sickness. So roughly one in four. For women, four in five felt motion sickness. Now, I don't know how accurate the demographics are for like this channel, for example, but when I look at the statistics and I've definitely seen women comment, I know Susie and there's a, a couple of others that have commented, but statistically it's small. I think it's 2%, 98% of the audience for this news channel is men. So I'd love to hear if there's any ladies out there watching this who have virtual reality do you personally get motion sickness? Uh, is that something you deal with? Only if you're comfortable talking about it, of course. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. You know, I'm always a little suspect of studies like that. Now, I know based on motion sickness in general, yes, it's accepted scientifically that women do suffer from motion sickness. The severities are the same between men and women, but the incidence, it's higher in women, right? How that translates to VR is what interests me. So I'd love to hear from you guys. All right, that's it for the news, guys. Like I said, I plan on getting uh, two games up today. The Arizona Sunshine, which was crashing constantly when I was trying to record with Open Broadcaster. Uh, definitely not the game's fault, Open Broadcaster's fault. I managed to get around it by not starting until a certain point. But uh, the beauty there is that I've uh, probably gone through that beginning section about 20 times, which is, you know, actually made me not suck so bad. So the video should be fairly decent. And then the other one that I hope to get up uh, also today is, of course, the Star Wars one on PlayStation VR. Cheers, guys. As always, catch you on the VR flip side.